Hey, Jamie Reed here with Customer Success. Uh, Matt Wilson, as part of our product organization, specifically the Senior Product Manager for Secure Threat and Insights, has uh, graciously offered to volunteer five minutes of his time to help uh, share a new piece of our documentation, which can help our customers adopt DevSecOps or adopt our application security functionality in uh, a clearer way with a prescriptive path. So Matt, thanks again for the time. If, uh, if you'd like to augment my introduction, please feel free. Oh, absolutely. No, that was perfect. Except one one thing it's going to take me a long time to get used to, and I'm going to have to update my, I see my Zoom title. We are actually now in the new govern stage. So it's going to have to get used to being the govern PM for Thread Insights, as if I guess yesterday. Yeah, and congrats on the rename. That's super exciting. And I think <laughs> that makes a lot of sense. We'll help our customers understand the intent behind uh, all of the, the related functionality as part of compliance and, and secure. So that's great. And thank you for, for working on that. Uh, and, let's uh, jump into this, um, this, this application security guide. I'll set the table here and just share that um, I think anyone on the customer success side that's had customer interactions with ultimate customers that you know understood the thesis that bought GitLab Ultimate for the, for the rationale of, of deploying a DevSecOps workflow across their organization. You know, one of the common pitfalls was just understanding where do I start and what are the common things that I should know about getting the most out of the scanning so that my dashboards display relevant results so that my merge requests show me what I might be potentially introducing in the feature branch? And how do I progress beyond step one? So going from zero to one and just understanding you know, how best to start, because there's a lot in Ultimate and it can be a pretty daunting process. So Matt, talk us through kind of what brought us to this particular part of our docs. Yeah, absolutely. So this was a direct result of just talking to a few different customers and they were expressing this, this kind of, it was almost being overwhelmed. Like you said, GitLab has all these different tools. If you're familiar with a lot of the scanning technologies at all, most people are comfortable with static analysis, a SAS tool, and they probably have a dependency checker. And then we come in and say, oh, well, we also have dynamic analysis and we have container scanning both on you know, the registry side as well as the live environment side. We have two different kinds of fuzz testing. We can do manual, right? So there's all these wonderful things that we have baked into the tool, but people were just not sure where to start. I actually had one customer that literally said, what would you recommend as an order of operations? We don't know where to start with this. So this was a collaboration between um, myself and the fellow product managers on the secure and protect teams, they own all of the different analyzer technologies. So we came up with this as a, I would call this not a, necessarily a best practice, but if you wanted a guideline to go from, as you said, from zero to one, I have nothing today, all the way through what I would consider a more advanced or mature security posture in terms of setup and configuration, this would be a helpful document to order those operations so um, that you don't get stuck in a corner or you're not turning on something that maybe doesn't make sense to turn on first. So to call attention to this, this is a this is actually a fairly new page. I think it's only been maybe a, a week or two that this has been merged into our docs. So now when you go to secure your application under the use section, we have this new getting started page. We start by recommending that you enable secret detection and dependency scanning. The reason that we recommend these two first, people are familiar with them and you are likely to find a lot of things that are already in your main application. I wanna call attention to the default branch qualification on here. So this is a question that comes up a lot. We need a default branch scan from any of the analyzers because that's what sets our baseline to compare against in any future feature branch. If you don't do that, what's going to happen is we do scan the entire code base every time in the feature branches with nothing to compare to. Every MR for every developer is going to show you all the vulnerabilities that are in that branch, which is going, essentially, it's going to be everything from your main branch, right? So it will be really confusing and noisy, and that's not what we want, obviously. So it is really important to turn on your branch scan, or sorry, your default branch scans first. If you're after simple, we recommend secret detection. The reason for that, 
unlike let's say static analysis where there are multiple analyzers depending on the language this one has just one it doesn't require a build of the application because it's just looking through the source code and it's kind of a one or a zero is it a secret is it not a secret that i would consider the bare minimum um, and then dependency scanning is also just a really good practice because it's so easy to get dependencies that are out of date even if it's not your primary dependency we will scan the entire dependency chain so it could be two or three levels down um, so we want to get those cleaned up so that not only are they not in your code base but you're going to have a lot cleaner starting point uh, as you move forward with future mrs as we go for, oh sorry you have a yeah, I was going to interject before we move off this this concept of default branch scanning. Matt, what would your recommendation be? You know, once I've got my YAML set up, so I'm I'm introducing these scanners for my default branch. Um, must I then immediately trigger a pipeline against my my default branch? And should I should I like how frequently do I need to trigger pipelines against that mainline branch or that default branch? And as I'm merging my feature requests, in my presumption is that those will then update our uh, data models understanding of vulnerabilities that are present in, in our default branch. But talk me through, again, getting that zero to one. I've got my YAML set up. Do I have to go manually trigger that pipeline? Uh, and should I be regularly doing that? Or will that happen um, as, as, as sort of course of business? That's a great question. One thing that this document doesn't do is it doesn't go into a lot of the nuances of how GitLab works in, in some other areas, like the pipelines, for instance. We've linked off to a lot of places around how to set up these various scanners. But the good news to your question, when you go in to modify your YAML configuration for that main project, when you make the update to turn on secret detection or dependency scanning, basically you can include our CI files for those uh, or YAML files for those. It will trigger a scan of the default branch because you have made a commit, you've made a change to that YAML file. So it will kick off a pipeline. So if you've got them turned on and you have them, um, if there are jobs that will run now, those jobs are gonna kick off as you commit uh, that YAML change. So you, you kind of get it for free, basically, if you start there. And then in terms of regularity, we have kind of there's two ways about this if you have a fairly active project where there are commits fairly frequently yes when you are doing the merge that's going to trigger again the pipelines on the main branch your default branch you're going to get the update scan so you actually kind of scan twice so you're if you're doing branch scans every commit you're going to get the security scans running if you have them configured there if you have the same analyzers configured to run and you're sort of I always forget the terminology, but basically the uh, as you are merging into the main branch, those uh, main branch scans, it'll run the same thing again. And that's what actually persists those vulnerability records to the database for that project. Awesome. Thank you. And then, and so we actually, we kind of covered this. So when you do your security scans, same scan should be enabled as a running under default branch. I'll give an example of why that's important. So let's say that you have dependency checking and static analysis on your main branch. And you decide for whatever reason, you're going to put secret detection only on your feature branch. What's going to happen is every single feature branch you open, every single MR, it's going to scan the entire code base. There's not going to be a record of any of those secrets on the main branch. So there's no vulnerability objects or records created. So every developer that opens a new branch is going to see all of the secrets presented to them like they're new every single time. Even if you dismiss those, they're still going to show up for every every person on that new MR because that scanner is not running on the main branch. There's nothing to compare it to. So in the absence of anything, we'll show you everything. So that's why it's really important to have that parity between um, those two configurations. And then I think we actually will skip down a little bit here. There are scheduled scans and my eyes skipping over it. If you see that on there, I think that is a recommendation that we made. Uh, yeah, I think point eight scan execution policies. Uh, no, that actually would imply every time a pipeline is run in terms of scheduling a scan, it may not actually be. Oh, did we leave that out? 
That's going to be fodder for a future MR, isn't it? That, that is going to be something I'm going to get off this call right now and add. That awesome. is a definite recommendation. So that would be the other thing. If you have a project that is, you know, let's say maybe less active, or even if it's not, you can, we would recommend doing a scheduled scan. So these are scans that are going to kick off without having to open a new MR. We would do this for things like dependency checking in particular, so that as new vulnerabilities come out, our database gets updated. You won't know about them unless you're actually running a scan. So scan that main branch, if not nightly, maybe every few days or weekly, something like that. Yeah, great call up. So for those less for those less um, active projects, particularly when the next like log for shell type vulnerability emerges, having a scheduled pipeline would help you be alerted immediately at the dashboard level. Oh, you know, new critical vulnerability uncovered. Here are the projects affected. That way, when your executives knock on your, your door virtually or, or physically, right, to say, hey, how do I respond to this? I just got this email. You've got an answer readily at hand. Absolutely. Same thing for like container scanning. So anything where the knowledge out in the, the wider world, the security community is likely to change and be updated, but your code is not, you want to run those scheduled scans so that you can, you can catch those new vulnerabilities. The rest of this is a little bit more on the kind of the interaction side, the vulnerability management. We're really talking through like steps three, four, five, and six is more how you would interact with it as maybe an engineer or a an AppSec you know, security team. So these are just some of our recommendations in terms of best practices. I'll call out number five here. So these scan result policies, you can think of these as security approvals. This basically says, when we see something new that matches the threshold of the policy, like as the developer introduces, let's say a new high or a critical severity vulnerability, I'm going to block merging unless I get an approval from somebody that's designated on that policy, which would usually be somebody in the security team. Again, this is really important because if you don't have anything in your main branch to compare that to, that's what this operates off of. So we're looking for those deltas. Otherwise, back to that secret detection example, every single time you run an MR, it's gonna probably trigger this policy. And so you'll, you'll be kind of stuck there. So you, that's again, why the default branch scans are really important. So I think one of the other like common misconceptions we should probably try and dispel here, Matt, would be the idea of, okay, I start with a default branch scan. If this is a mature pro uh, project, I'm likely to find all kinds of uh, vulnerabilities that are reported back from that default branch scan. We're not suggesting that as part of going from zero to one and as part of implementing a DevSecOps workflow in your organization, that you immediately must triage all of those findings. The point of doing the default branch scan is to get to that baseline so that then you can focus your team in avoiding newly introduced vulnerabilities within that MR widget. You also have the optionality to over time triage that that tech debt, that vulnerability debt, to understand. All right, let's go in stack rank order of most severe to least severe. Do we think this is something that warrants remediation, or can I dismiss this as I won't fix or something I'm not concerned about? But you've got the optionality to snap that chalk line at a baseline, and then focus your effort in net new, uh, avoiding net new vulnerabilities being introduced as part of that merge request workflow. There's not necessarily a requirement to immediately triage all of the debt that might have existed in an older project. That's an excellent point. I also love the snap the chalk line thing. Appeals to the home DIY person in me. Yes, that is really, really true. That's what a lot of customers that I talk to, that's kind of their experience, especially when you've got legacy projects that are an active, you know, if not development customer use, they may have been. 10, 20 years when the before, you know, or when the code base started, you're going to find a lot. And it's going to take a long time to triage through it. And that can be very overwhelming. But exactly like you said, you need the base so that you can only look at the net new stuff. Because the idea is let's prevent any new risk from entering the application, right? You're you've just exposed something that you just didn't know about, but it was already there. So it's not actually any riskier than it already was, but let's not let the risk get any higher. That's where number five, those scan result policies come in really handy. Um, I highly recommend it. It's something that we really try to get organizations comfortable with. 
I know there can be resistance because you are putting some friction in the developer workflow. It's something that they have to go through. But I think the question becomes, would you rather introduce some of that friction now and contain additional risk? Or do you want to accept that you're going to continue merging vulnerabilities, which you now know about, by the way, because you can see them going into your code base. The other thing too, is the scan result policies, they're flexible. So a recommendation is don't turn it on for everything and say anything that's lower above from all the scanners has to be fixed or you can't merge. Set it to critical, pick some of the analyzers that you care the most about, like a critical dependency, you probably wanna look at. If it's a medium severity static analysis vulnerability, there's a good chance that that may not be as you know applicable, could even be potentially a false positive in your context. So. Um, you can be very progressive with that. Another point, don't turn off for all the projects at once. Start with a, a project where ideally you've got a security champion or a wheeling engineering team to, to dog food that. If you've got 2,000 projects or 5,000, as some of the large GitLab customers have in their instances, don't turn that on for everything at once because it's just going to be, everything's going to seem on fire and people aren't going to know how to react to that. So like everything, start small, build out from there. Great insights. Matt, thank you again for taking time with me today. I really appreciate it and I hope the team does as well. I'll get this up on YouTube so that uh, we can benefit from it internally and anybody reviewing this externally, hopefully will also find this beneficial. If you're an existing GitLab customer that has a relationship with your CSC or CSM, don't hesitate to reach out to them if you've got questions. We've also got a community forum and of course our talented support folks that you can contact should you have more questions. Matt, thanks again for your time. I really appreciate it. Anytime. Thank you.